Albert Einstein was born in 1879, and he died in 1955. He was a German-born Jewish physicist who's best known for his theory of relativity, and specifically, mass energy equivalence, E equals mc squared. In 1999, Einstein was named Time Magazine's Person of the Century, and a poll named him the greatest physicist of all time. He had such an impact upon modern culture that the name Einstein has become synonymous with the word genius. In this program, we're going to take a look at this fascinating man and find out what he believed about life's most important issue. Is there a God? And then we're going to turn the spotlight on you and find out if you are an Einstein. Are you a good person? Have you ever lied? What happens after someone dies? Have you ever stolen anything? Trust in Christ. There are many who, in an attempt to show atheism to be intellectual, have claimed that Albert Einstein was an atheist. However, the brilliant scientist said the exact opposite. In the view of such harmony in the cosmos, which I, with my limited human mind, am able to recognize, there are yet people who say there is no God. But what makes me really angry is that they quote me for support of such views. Einstein also said, We know nothing about God and the world at all. All our knowledge is but the knowledge of school children. Possible we shall know a little more than we do now but the real nature of things, that we shall never know, never. He even revealed his insightful mind with, I see a pattern, but my imagination cannot picture the maker of the pattern. I see a clock, but I cannot envision the clockmaker. The human mind is unable to conceive of the four dimensions. So how can it conceive of a God before whom a thousand years and a thousand dimensions are as one? When asked, to what extent are you influenced by Christianity, he said, As a child, I received instruction in both the Bible and the Talmud. I am a Jew, but I am enthralled by the luminous figure of the Nazarene. When asked if he accepted the historical existence of Jesus, he replied, Unquestionably, no one can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word. No myth is filled with such life. Albert Einstein wasn't a fool. He believed in God. He said of the Creator's existence, I am not an atheist. I don't think I can call myself a pantheist. The problem involved is too vast for our limited minds. We are in the position of a little child entering a huge library filled with books in many languages. The child knows someone must have written those books. It does not know how. It does not understand the languages in which they are written. The child dimly suspects a mysterious order in the arrangement of the books, but doesn't know what it is. That, it seems to me, is the attitude of even the most intelligent human being toward God. We see the universe marvelously arranged and obeying certain laws, but only dimly understand these laws. He continued, What separates me from most so-called atheists is a feeling of utter humility toward the unattainable secrets of the harmony of the cosmos. In fact, Einstein tended to be more critical of debunkers who seemed to lack humility or a sense of awe than of the faithful. He wrote in a letter, The fanatical atheists are like slaves who are still feeling the weight of their chains which they have thrown off after hard struggle. They are creatures who, in their grudge against traditional religion as the opium of the masses, cannot hear the music of the spheres. In other words, because of their hatred of traditional religion, they can't see the genius of God's handiwork in creation. Okay, in a minute, we're going to have a test to see if you are a genius. Now, we're going to test your intelligence level, and you're going to need a pen and a paper. So, please get this, or it won't work. You're going to have one minute before we start, so go get the pen and paper. And while you're doing that, here's another quote from Albert Einstein. I want to know how God created this world. I'm not interested in this or that phenomenon, in the spectrum of this or that element. I want to know his thoughts. The rest are details. Those who take time to read the Bible can know how God created this world. Just read Genesis chapter 1. 
and they can read the thoughts of God throughout Holy Scripture. But the reason many people won't believe it is because it's not merely a history book. The Bible is also a moral book, and for that reason, many people refuse to believe its pages. All right, here now is the test. Now, to make this work, please don't talk to anyone while you listen and write down your answers. Sorry, we're not going to be able to repeat the questions. You'll only have a chance to hear them once, so listen carefully. Number one, how many of each animal did Moses bring onto the ark? Number two, what is the name of that raised print that deaf people use? Number three, is it possible to end a sentence with the word the? Number four, spell the word shop, shop. All right, what do you do when you come to a green light? Write it down. Number five, it's noon. You look at the clock and the big hand is on the three and the little hand is on the five. What time is it? Number six, spell the word silk. Silk, okay. What do cows drink? Number seven, listen carefully. You are the driver of a train. There are 30 people on board. At the first stop, 10 people get off the train. At the next stop, five people get on the train. Now here's the question. What is the name of the driver of the train? It's amazing how we can think we know something and be completely wrong. Often we don't take the time to listen carefully before we answer. Now try these. Read out loud the wording in the three triangles. Come on, read out loud. Let's now look at the answers to each of these questions. Number one, how many of each animal did Moses take into the ark? None, it was Noah. Moses didn't take any animals into the ark. Number two, what is the name of the raised print that deaf people use? Deaf people don't use raised print. It's blind people that use braille. Number three, is it possible to end a sentence with the word the? Of course, this question is an example of one. Number four, spell the word shop. What do you do when you come to a green light? At green lights, you don't stop, you go. Number five, it is noon, you look at the clock. The big hand is on three, the little hand is on five. What time is it? Well, if it is noon, it is noon. Get a new clock. Number six, spell the word silk. What do cows drink? Uh-uh, they don't drink milk. Cows drink water. Number seven, listen carefully. You're the driver of a train. There are 30 people on board. The first stop, 10 people get off. At the next stop, five people get on. Now for the question, what is the name of the train driver? Well, this was the question. Listen carefully. You are the driver of a train. Number eight, Paris in the, the spring. Bird in the, the hand. Once in a, a lifetime. So how'd you do? Do you feel a bit humbled? We did too. The point of these tests should remind us that our eyes and our ears can fool us. Our senses are not always trustworthy, and as human beings, we are prone to make mistakes. And the Bible warns, he who trusts in himself is a fool. Do you trust your own judgments? Of course. Spell the word shop. Spell the word what? Shop, where you buy things, shop. S-H-O-P. What do you do when you come to a green light? You stop. Green light. Go. Spell the word shop. S-H-O-P. What do you do when you come to a green light? Stop. <clears throat> green light. Oh, go. <laughs> S-H-O-P. What do you do when you come to a green light? I stop. Green light. I go. Stop. Green light. Stop. Green light. Oh, go. <laughs> go. <laughs> what do you do when you come to a green light?
do when you come to a green light? You stop. Green light. Uh, so <laughs> you got me. Spell the word silk. S-I-L-K. What do cows drink? Milk. Milk. They drink water. Milk. <laughs> Cow. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh... Milk. No. No. <laughs> what do cows drink? Milk. Cows don't drink milk. They drink water. They eat grass and drink water. <laughs> this is funny. What is the name of the raised print that deaf people use? What is the what? Name of the raised print that deaf people use. Braille. Deaf people? Blind people! Oh no, you got me! Okay. <laughs> uh, Braille? Deaf people. Uh, deaf people can't hear, but I believe they can read, so they probably just read regular normal print. Hey, how many of each animal did Moses take into the ark? Two. Moses? Uh, no, not Moses, Noah! Two of each. You sure? Yes. Moses? <laughs> no. Moses? Oh, no. <laughs> really mess it up. No. No. Okay. I thought he brought two. Two? Of each one. Moses? <laughs> I want you to read the wording in the triangle. Can you do that? Paris in the spring, bird in the hand, once in a lifetime. It doesn't say that. It says Paris in the, the spring, bird in the, the hand. Once in a, a lifetime. Oh, wow, it sure does. Ryan, could you read the wording in the triangles out loud? Paris in the spring, bird in the hand, once in a lifetime. And you got three wrong. You realize that? Sure, you told me to read them. So Doesn't say that. You read wrong. Yeah, you told me to read that. Paris in the, the spring. Ooh, bird in the, the hand. You got it. That's good. That's good. As small as this, imagine if you're wrong about your eternal salvation. Imagine okay. if God is right but and wrong. See that? I read it now and it says Paris in the, the spring. Show me something that proves me wrong that God exists. Tell me that. Creation proves it. Because you're showing me that. That's, that's proof. That's in writing. Now, show Ryan, me something. Spell the word shock. Because all you keep doing spell is talking word. to me about this. Spell the you're word shock. Spell the word shock. Shop? Yeah, we invite things. Shop. Spell it? Yeah. S H O P. What do you do when you come to a green light? You stop. No, green light. Uh, <laughs> none of this proves. It proves that you make mistakes. Yes, you're exactly right. And you could be making a mistake about your eternal salvation. We tend to trust our eyes. We say things like, seeing is believing. Well, have you ever seen a sunrise? You say, of course I have. Sorry, you haven't. No one has ever seen the sunrise or a sunset. The sun remains still while the earth turns, giving us the impression it's rising and setting. Have you ever seen a blue sky? You say, of course I've seen a blue sky. No, you haven't. The sky is no color. Ask any astronaut if he had to scrape blue off the space shuttle when he came down to earth. There's no color to the sky. It just looks blue from here on earth. Any magician will tell you that the eye can't be trusted because the hand is quicker than the eye. Now this isn't magic, it's called sleight of hand. Take a dollar bill, here's the back, fold it up, blow on it, and it becomes a toy. Well take the scarf, take it from the right hand and put it into the left. Which hand is it in, the left or the right? You know what it is? It's in the mouth. Here's the point of all this. If we can be wrong about things that don't matter, we can also be wrong about the things that do matter. And of all the things that matter most, we can't afford to be wrong about the existence of God and of heaven and hell. And the Bible makes it very clear that he who trusts in his own judgments is a fool. So why are there so many people who do base their beliefs on eternity by what seems right to them rather than on the ultimate source of reliability, God's own word? They wrongly assume that there is no hell or if there's a heaven, they're going to go there because they think they're a good person. Again, 
The Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Now let's see if you're going to go to heaven. Let me give you a little test. Do you consider yourself to be a good person? Yeah, I do. Pretty good. Okay, here's the, here's the test. When I'm at my best. Okay, let's see if you're at your best. Have you ever told a lie? Yeah, on occasion. What do you call someone who tells lies? Uh, you know, I, I try not to call them liars anymore, but I, they, they are. Have you ever stolen something? Yes. What do you call someone who steals things? In my case, I was a petty thief. Okay, have you ever used God's name in vain? Ah, uh, yeah. Like, I've heard you use it in this interview, actually, a number of times. It's called blasphemy. Yeah, it's called oh. blasphemy. It's very serious in God's sight. I'm not even aware of it, yeah. I'm, uh, that I did it. Yeah, that's why it's in vain. It's counted as worthless, and it rolls off your tongue as though it has no, oh, okay. no honor. Okay, I understand that. It's very it's, serious. It's, 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 it doesn't mean... How did I do that? Could you point that out to me? How did I actually take his name oh. in vain? I don't know what I when did. When you get a fright or something, you use his name, like, instead of saying S, instead of using a filth word, you use God's name as a substitute and you do it subconsciously. Um, here's the last question. Jesus said whoever looks upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery already with her in his heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? I think I just, I may have done that about 10 minutes ago down here in Huntington Beach. Okay, well listen to this, Judge. <laughs> I may have done that. Listen to this. Yeah. You're not a good person in God's sight. By your own admission, yeah. you're a lying, thieving, blasphemous adulterer at heart. And you have to face God on Judgment Day. If he judges you by the Ten Commandments, we've looked at four of them, if he judges you by the Ten Commandments on the Day of Judgment, do you think he'd be innocent or guilty? Uh, I tell you, I'm the young... You did it again. I did it again, I went... I, I, I'm yeah, sorry. That, you wanted me to point it out, that's, that's blasphemy. So innocent or guilty? I'll be in between there. I'll be, I'll be lukewarm. No, you're either innocent or guilty. <laughs> I can help you out, you'd be guilty. You know, lying, thieving, blasphemous, adulterate heart. Maybe. Not as bad as some, though. No, well, you're not as bad as Hitler, yeah. but that Hitler, Hitler won't be there, and you won't be judged by that standard. You're going to be stand but judged by the Ten Commandments. Now, listen to this. Will you therefore go to heaven or hell if he judges you by that standard? Oh, man, I, I hope I go to heaven. Well, I, but you may be hoping, but I think you're saying a word, but the Bible says all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. No thief will inherit God's kingdom. No blasphemer, no adulterer. Remember, that's only four of the Ten Commandments, and God's seen your thought life. Nothing is hid from the eyes of him with whom we have to give an account. I don't know. I just, I have a hard time thinking that God would send me to hell. But think maybe of your, I'm Think wrong. of your sin. Yeah, well, it's like a, like a criminal who's just raped and murdered a woman saying, I have a hard time the judge has sent me to prison. Well, I have a hard time, but it's going to happen. Justice is going to be done. God is good by nature, and he must see that justice is done. He's not going to allow injustice on the day of judgment. So does it concern you that if you died today, you'd end up in hell? Uh, I, of course it would. I mean, if... If I do end up in hell, can I get out? No, it's eternal. Oh. That's what damnation is. Death is the doorway to damnation for those that die in their sins. Here's the question, though. If a person gets condemned to hell and he can't get out, what? Then he has no choice but to try to join the devil and go up against God to try to win. Well, I guess, because he has no way out. Look at me when you talk, it'll help. Um, do you know what God did for us so we wouldn't have to go to hell? Well, I know that you're talking about his son sacrificing himself for us. Yeah, God, right. so God we wouldn't yeah. have to. God became a person. The Bible says God was manifest in the flesh. God became a person in Jesus Christ. He created for himself a body and filled that body as a hand fills a glove. He was the express image of the invisible God. And this perfect sinless man gave his life as a sacrifice for our sins. In other words, you broke God's law and Jesus paid your fine in his life's blood. He satisfied justice. His last words on the cross were, it is finished. In other words, the debt has been paid. He loved you so much, Judge, that he shed his blood, suffered and died, taking the punishment for your sins, bruised for our iniquities. Then the Bible says he rose from the dead, defeating death. And what you must do to receive forgiveness of sins and God's gift of everlasting life is repent. That means turn from sin. Stop that lusting. Stop the blasphemy. Stop the lying and stealing and trust in Jesus Christ. The moment you trust in Jesus Christ, God will give you his Holy Spirit. You'll be born again. He'll justify you, make it as though you'd never sinned. He'll make you righteous in his sight so that on the day of judgment, you won't come under his wrath. So what do you got to do? Repent and trust the Savior, repentance and faith. When do you think you're going to do that? 
I thought I did it, but apparently I haven't really done it. And I guess according when to this you, interview, I, when are you going to do it? I guess I'm going to do it right after this is over. <laughs> I try to. We, we can pray together when this interview's finished. Okay. During World War II, Air Force records revealed that a plane and a crew had completely disappeared on their first combat mission. The aircraft was found an incredible thousand miles past its target. Investigators found that the crew had bailed out of the plane just before it crashed in the 140 degree Libyan desert. Most of the crew's bodies were discovered 78 miles from where they bailed out. One of the men had walked an incredible 140 miles before he died. What baffled military experts for years was how any plane could end up a thousand miles past its target. This is what happened. A strong tailwind had caused them to arrive at their destination faster than what they'd estimated. The instruments told them that arrived, but they made the fatal mistake of not believing their instruments, and instead they trusted their own natural senses. There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. So don't make the same even more fatal mistake when it comes to your eternal salvation. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He'll direct your path. In light of these thoughts, it's interesting to notice that at the age of 34, a young Albert Einstein proudly boasted of something that seemed right to him. I have firmly resolved to bite the dust when my time comes, with the minimum of medical assistance. And up to then, I will sin to my wicked heart's content. As Albert Einstein aged, he became far more philosophical. To one bent on age, death will come as a release. I feel this quite strongly now that I have grown old myself and have come to regard death like an old death at long last to be discharged. Still, instinctively, one does everything possible to postpone the final settlement. Such is the game that nature plays with us. It seems that Albert Einstein spoke biblical truth unawares. However, it isn't nature that seeks a final settlement, it's the law of God. Like a criminal who's transgressed civil law, Einstein, like the rest of humanity, was in debt to eternal justice because he had transgressed God's law. This great debt that he spoke of couldn't be satisfied with mere silver and gold. It's a debt that demands capital punishment. It calls for the death penalty for guilty transgressors and eternal damnation in hell. Its terrible decree demands the soul that sins, it shall die but it's a demand that was fully satisfied by the one who cried from Calvary's cross, it is finished. It was paid in full by the precious blood of Jesus. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Most of us think that we're rather intelligent and the more knowledge we get, the more puffed up we become with pride. If you don't believe it, try talking to the average university student about the things of God. They're more than often condescending towards the gospel. They think they're too intelligent to believe it. Their attitude brings up a very important point. A man once looked into a store window and he saw a sight that he could hardly believe. There was a cat sitting in the window and it was a mangy cat. It was a flea-bitten, rat-ridden, ugly cat. His ear was chewed off, his tail was chewed off, half his fur was missing. I mean, this was an ugly cat. And then his eyes widened because next to the cat there was a sign and it said, cat for sale, $50. He thought, what? Somebody wants 50 bucks for a flea-bitten, rat-ridden, ugly cat? He couldn't believe it. And then he saw something that made his eyes widen even further. The cat was drinking milk from a saucer that he recognized as a Ming Dynasty saucer, worth thousands of dollars. So he immediately grabbed his wallet, ran into the store, and said, hey, mister, I'll take that cat, thanks a lot, and here's your 50 bucks. And then he picked up the cat, and he said, uh, by the way, I'll just take that old saucer to keep the cat company. Oh, no. And the guy said, you leave that saucer right there. I've sold 70 cats with that saucer this week. That man was sneered or trapped by his own craftiness. And the Bible says that God has ensnared the wicked by their own craftiness. What does that mean? Let me explain. Many years ago, I ran a kids club. At its conclusion, I would take a big bag of candy and give them a piece of candy each. One day, I told the kids to line up, and as I looked at that line, I saw that the little brat bullies had pushed their way to the front. At the back of the line were the meek, quiet, sickly ones. I remember thinking, that's a line of greed if ever I saw one. 
Then I had an idea. I said, kids, stay where you are. Everybody turn about face. I said, if you move and get out of line, you're not getting any candy. Every kid turned about face, and I had great delight in taking that big bag of candy to the other end of the line first and giving it to the meek, sickly, quiet kids, much to the disgust of the greedy fat brats at the back. That's how God has trapped the wicked in his own craftiness. God has turned the line around. In this world where the rich get richer and the poor get stomped on, God has done something incredible. The Bible says God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You just ask a proud person if they'll admit that they're a sinner, therefore are deserving of hell, and are willing to repent and follow Jesus Christ no matter what the cost, and you'll usually hear, what are you kidding me? I don't believe that silly message. Behold the wisdom of God. The Bible says that God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He's chosen the not many wise, the not many mighty, the not many noble. You find that people who are proud of their intellectual abilities, their social standing, their great accomplishments will really stoop to believe the gospel. Through their own pride, they exclude themselves from understanding the truth. God designed it this way and even said that we must come to him as what? As a little child. So if you want to enter heaven, be wise. Make sure you humble yourself as a little child and don't trust in your own understanding. Remember, human nature is prone to error. The man who put the eraser on the tip of the pencil knew what he was doing. What we need to do is turn back to God's instruction book, the Bible, the ultimate source of reliability and wisdom. We hope this program has been both entertaining and helpful to you in understanding the great truth that God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Thanks for joining us. Well, take the scarf, take it from the right hand and put it into the left. Which hand is it in? The left or the right? You know where it is? It's in the mouth. <laughs> what is this? Like a... <laughs>this episode of wave the master has inspired you to share the message of eternal life you can watch our award-winning movies such as the atheist delusion freely on our website where you'll also find articles videos and audio messages as well as books dvds gospel tracts and other resources to help you share your faith biblically and effectively make sure to visit livingwaters.com today